Welcome back, everybody, to the Built for Anything podcast. I am your host, Hertz, and today my guest is Max Million. Now, Max is an artist, rapper um, from Duncanville here in Texas, and I can tell you right now, he's a really, really dope brother, uh, got a really good head on his shoulders, and in this episode, we talk about him pursuing his passion, man, him pursuing his music and the sacrifices that he has to take in order to achieve the level of success that he wants in his life. I think this podcast would be definitely beneficial for any of you guys out there who feel like there's a goal that you're trying to reach and you're working really, really hard. And maybe you might feel like nobody's watching and you might be feeling like giving up. This is a podcast that I think is going to make sure that you stay on track. All right. Don't give up. Keep pursuing your goals. Now, if you find any value from any of my podcasts, please feel free to subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, leave a review on YouTube. Also, please consider signing up to my Patreon. This way you can get exclusive benefits such as being able to watch these episodes before anybody else, as well as some other exclusive content. All right. And you can be part of the group for as little as three dollars. All right. So. I'm sure we got $3, all right? Guys, thank you for watching. Enjoy the show. And without further ado, Max Million. Let's go. Welcome back, everybody, to the Built for Anything podcast. Man, I got a dope guest here with me today. Thank you. Max Million. What's up? What's up? Say what's up to the people, bro. What's up, y'all? How you doing? Tell them a little bit about yourself, man. Yeah, okay. Um... Well, I'm Maximilian. I come from Duncanville, Texas. Um, Texas? I'm, yeah, Texas. Is that north? Is that south? Where is that? Is That's that north? Not south. That's 67 South. Okay, okay, okay. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, I come from Duncanville, Texas. I've been here in Texas since um, since 11, really. So yeah, that's about it. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So I know you're into a couple things, man, particularly, well, particularly the music, bro. Um, I definitely want to touch on that, man. Um, you as an artist... Well, first of all, what are, what are the things that you're into? Because I want to make sure we cover everything. But let the people know what are some of the things that the project or some of the things that you that you're doing. Well, what nine fourteen so far? Um, as far as the project, it's really just about a broken home, and uh, it's not really a performance album, but it's more of a conscious hip hop type album. And I wouldn't even like to label it conscious hip hop. It's just telling my truth as a black kid, you know, from my struggle, from my community, in a black community. Mm-hmm. I feel like. A lot of times in the black community, we don't really get to go to therapy. They would even, say, they would mm-hmm. even call it therapy. Mm-hmm. As black people, we don't get to express our feelings of uh, what we're going through unless it's an album or unless it's, uh, you know, some microphone in front of you. Mm-hmm. Nobody's trying to hear you unless you've got a microphone in front of you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, 914 is just the social ills that's going on in my community, Okay, particularly my home. Okay. So, yeah. So you, no, I don't think the people kind of pick up on that. But you're a rapper, yeah, right. Um, how did you get your name? Because what's your what's it, I want people to understand. So yeah, your real name versus Maximine. right. Yeah. And so even as your artist name, it's Maximilian. Well, how did we get there? My real name is Maximilian M A X I M L L I O N, and then my artist name is Maximilian. Um, my father used to have his own company, of course, and uh, he was a I wouldn't say he was a multimillionaire, but my father had money. You know, he was making bank. And uh, he owned a business called Blue Cross Shield up in Detroit. And so when I was born, my father had a lot of huge aspirations for me. And he was like, man, I want to name my son something big, something huge. And Maximilian, you know, Maximilian in Greek just means the greatest. So, yeah. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't label myself as the greatest, man. I like, I really like being humble, but I would say that, um, I think I'm a great person. So that yeah. hey, that's it's better to aspire to be that, right? Yeah. Be a great person and rather be great in everything. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting because even when we spoke for the first time, mm-hmm. I remember asking you like, "Hey, man, is that really your real name? Yeah. Like, yeah. what is this at an alias?" And you're like, "No, no, that's my real name." And mm-hmm. and you mentioned there was a story behind it, and it's interesting that you actually took that and ran with it as being an artist because most people come up with something totally different or play on words and. Um, what's, why did you decide to, to stick with that name and not go with something else? Man, Max May has always been 
me as an artist. I've never been no one else. I've never tried to come up with a different moniker or a different, you know, alias. Personally, I believe that Maximilian is just me. Mm -hmm. And when I heard Kendrick Lamar, he's one of my influences. Okay. I wouldn't say I look up to him, but he's one of my influences. When I heard Kendrick Lamar say that he chose Kendrick Lamar after K-Dot because he wanted his music to be more personal, I took mm -hmm. that and ran with that. Minus, mm -hmm. I was rapping before, you know, I discovered Kendrick Lamar. I was rapping under the alias Maximilian. Mm -hmm. But that just gave it a little bit more strength to say, okay, well, I want my music to be more personal to my fans, mm -hmm. to really portray a good, deep, interpersonal message. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. When, where did it all start, though? You know, mm -hmm. with the music, like uh, where did it start? Was this something that you were into, you know, as a, as a toddler? Yeah. Or was that something you just picked up recently? Where where did it start? I started doing music when I was no more than 10 through like 12. I can't really put a, a gap on it, but I would uh -huh. say 10 years old. And when I was doing my music, I first started out doing plays. My mom used to tell me all the time, man, boy, you have a, a voice. You know, mm -hmm. you have you have a voice of articulation. And so I would, I wouldn't speak as often, but I would voice my plays. And people started to uh, really take note of that and really uh, admire that, you know. And my English teacher in fifth grade, Ms. Coppersmith, she came to me and she said, you're, you're a great speaker, but one thing we have to do is broaden your vocabulary. Mm. So she brought me at the source. Mm, that's was usually like, where it starts. Like, that's where like, it starts. I was like, what do I do with at the source? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So... I went home, I studied that for a couple of days, and then she bought me some poem book and told me to write a story. And the entire story went from a story to a rhyme to a song. Because at mm. that time I was very influential by, uh, you know, people like uh, Eminem, 50 Cent, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. that era of 2005. Mm -hmm. So that's me. Back that's how when, it began. Back when music was, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Which brings me to this. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the music today, man? I'm curious as to what your perspective is going, you know, you being an artist yourself. Like, what do you seeing the difference, seeing the people that you looked at growing up and then seeing and and I'm not saying everybody who's out there isn't isn't making quality music. But it seems nowadays that um, you don't necessarily need to make quality music. Right. If you, if you just have a dope beat. Or, you know, you, 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 your, your fame translated from maybe you a Vine person or Instagram person and then all of a sudden you're doing music or it's like you don't necessarily need to be talented anymore in the actual art of rhyming to be successful. What do you, what, what's your take on that, man? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to modern day music, I, I think modern day hip hop is disco in the 70s. And mm -hmm. Jam Master J said that. No, it wasn't Jam Master J. It was, uh, I forgot who it was in the Run DMC crew, but it was some brother who said that, man. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hip hop today is no different than disco in the 70s. You know, you see people with flashy minks. And I'm going to compare the 70s to modern day 2018. Mm -hmm. The 70s was flashy minks, you know, big old shoes, um, big escalated parties, a lot of coke, a lot of drugs, mm -hmm. a lot of glorious, fake, fictitious type of lifestyle, you know. People partied their lifestyle away mm -hmm. instead of expressing their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Hip hop came no later than the 70s, of course, up mm -hmm. in, uh, I think it was Bronx. I think mm -hmm. it was Bronx, the homeland. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, the person from Run DMC said they started hip hop because that disco life was so far fetched from what they were actually dealing with that they had nothing. They couldn't even believe that. They couldn't mm -hmm. even get down with that because it didn't fit their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so with hip hop today, I don't relate to the I got five hoes by me. You know what I'm saying? I don't relate mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. I got, you know, this this uh, bust down watch like that's cool, man. But what's your inner heart say? What's your character like? Because mm -hmm. a bust down watch can be replaced, but a, a good character can't, man. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. Um, how do you how would you classify your music? Like you, you I, I know you mentioned a couple of artists. You mentioned Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we know what kind of music he makes. You know, would you say if somebody's listening to your music, can they expect more or less the same thing? And or how is what you know, how is your content different? Well, I mean, I would say that the apple doesn't far, fall from too far from the tree. Mm -hmm. You know, um, J. Cole looked up to Nas. He looked mm -hmm. up to Lil Wayne. He looked up to uh, Master P and, uh, and so forth. Kendrick, a lot of people don't know this, but Kendrick looked up to Jay-Z, you know? Mm. And so um, hip-hop I thought is, it would have been like Dre or something. Well, no. Dre don't really, you know, but 
I he thought did, it would have been a West Coast person. Now he did say it started off with with the West Coast, of course, and mm-hmm. that was during the era Easy where, yeah, that's, that's when what I when uh, Pac was, you know, mm-hmm, battling mm-hmm. everybody almost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then after the whole battle, you know, he started to listen to artists like Biggie, of course. And he was mm-hmm. like, man, these people are dope, and mm-hmm. so that's when he started really philosophizing himself around Jay Z. Mm. So yeah. And so I want you to I want to get in your head a little bit, mm-hmm. especially as as an artist, because I'm always um, I know when when you're an artist and you can be an artist in different things or even when you're passionate about something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure you're a student of music. Um, you, you especially as an artist, I'm sure you really dive into as much things as you can dive into. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to get in your head into into what your process is like. How do you go from point A to point B in terms of maybe completing a song or completing mm-hmm. an idea? Take me into like, what is that process like? Are you at home with the pad? Are you, you know, on your phone? Are you like, describe that zone for me. Well, I mean, to break it down in a short sense, I have to put myself in the, uh, almost in the situation. Like out in Duncanville, people don't know there's a lot of panhandling. Mm. And I've seen it firsthand front. You know, I'm a very generous person when it comes to giving. But I've seen myself give a guy, you know, like $10 one time. This guy gets up goes to his red truck when no one was looking and rides right into my neighborhood and I don't know where he went. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I wrote a song called uh, Poor Man's Handling. You know what I'm saying? And that's going to be on 914. And the whole essence of it is really... 914 is the name of the album? Mm-hmm. 914 Duncanville. That's, that's the Nine, name of my 940. Place. No, 914 Duncanville. Nine, okay, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. But um, that's the essence. Like when I write a song, I have to put myself in a situation. Either I've been in it or mm-hmm. I have to put myself in it. And nine mm-hmm. times out of 10, if I've been in it, the song is really deep. But if I have to put myself in a situation, I think, man, it takes me about three to four hours to finish. Mm-hmm. You know, because I'm really, really thinking, how would I feel if I was in a situation? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So you do draw from a lot of maybe, your, like you said, your past experiences, mm-hmm. uh, things that you see out there. Um what is your I'm curious, like I've seen some of your clips where you're on stage. So clearly you, you've been in front of people, you've, you've performed. Yeah. What's that like? Like, what's that? You know, when you're looking out in the crowd of however many people like what, what's going on in your head? It's nervous at first. And it's like every single show is nervous at first. Mm-hmm. And you're always going to get that. You know, you're always going to get that that uh, fear mm-hmm. because fear is the unknown. It's not the fact that you you've mastered. Uh, you know, being in front of a bunch of people, it's the fear of, man, what if I forget my lyrics? Mm. What if I trip? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because don't nobody want to trip on stage in front of a lot of people. Yeah. Or, With YouTube now, they, everybody yeah. got a cell phone. Yeah, man. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, what if I, what if I throw up? Some, mm-hmm. some retarded. But then when you just totally void all of that and just get up there and do what you came there to do, it's, it's done, man. It's mm-hmm. done. And people remember you because you said you were going to come there and do what you were going to do. Mm-hmm. And that's how I look at every show that I do. When I go there, I perform. Mm-hmm. I try my best to bring as much energy as I would want the track to be portrayed as. Mm-hmm. And I just go. Feedback or no feedback. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah. What's the, what, what would you say the largest group that you've uh, performed in front of? Mm. Probably would be for, your co- for the Culture Studios. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. How many people? It's probably would you about, say? Give or take. Give or take. Like 700, 70 to 100 people. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so it was, a, good, it was people, a good man. show. Yeah. It was a real good show. That's a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. So did you um do you kind of psych yourself out before you get on get on stage? Do you are there things that you kind of tell yourself to to calm yourself down? Like you said, I know that that nervousness mm-hmm. coming, or is it just like as soon as you you know you get there, like that switch goes off and you're just like everything calms down, everything slows down. Well, I mean, I'm a previous boxer as well. So when I would step okay. in the ring, everything that I would do before I started, you know, sparring. It's just repetition. It's repetition. You mm-hmm. have to really practice. Muscle Mike memory. Tyson said, mm-hmm. and this is what I remember. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get knocked out. And until they get punched in right, the face. Right, until they get punched in the face. And it's like, <laughs> right. yo, I think about that with music. I can, I can rehearse, it's rehearse, true. rehearse until I get on that stage. So it's either kill it then or forget about it, man. Do you usually perform by yourself or do you, do you have, um, are there other people that, you know, that, that you rap with? Yeah, so it's just, it's all solo, correct? Mm, I do have some solo shows, but most shows that I've had, I've had a couple of people come with me, like, uh, shout out to, uh, what's his name? Solo Soldier. You know, he's come with okay. me on Nappy Head Israelite. Okay. Uh, my, you know, my fiance, Taya, of course, she's come with me on uh, so many of my performances, but still, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. 
Shout, shout out to Tia. Of, shout out to Tia, man. <laughs> shout out to that girl right there. She's in yeah. a robe. Shout out to her. Yeah, man. It's, it's good. It's good to support. You know what your partner, what what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that's um that's very important. Mm-hmm. You know to get that because I'm sure you know she's seen you know your process and seen probably where you come from. I don't know how long you got necessarily been together, but I'm yeah. sure she's she's been around for a good part of it. And yeah. And for you to be where you are now compared to before, I'm sure, you know, it's something to be respected, man. And it's good that she's on board. Especially building with your partner, man. Nobody, Mm -hmm. there's no business built more stronger than a a very family oriented business. You know, Mm -hmm. nothing more built stronger. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, What do you what do you dislike about the music industry, though, man? Because there's there's a lot of there's a perception out there. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you this. Um especially from the outside looking in, right? Or at least these are things that you hear, and I'm sure you've heard it. It's not it's not a big secret. But it seems almost like everybody who's successful almost has to, like, sell their soul in order to be successful, right? right? Um, and do, you know, do things that they sh- they don't really want to do in order just to, to, to get a deal or just to, you know, how do you feel about, have you come, first of all, have, have you been in scenarios where you felt like you, um, you were being forced to compromise what your, you know, your beliefs are or compromise really just what your quality of music is just to appease the masses. Has that ever happened to you? Man, I think that's every day. And I'm not even going to say me as an artist, that's one struggle I struggle with. That's any person who believes in the Bible or any person who believes in morals. When you have morals, you just straight up say, I'm not going to do that. And I've I've written a couple of songs that are just straight out there like butt naked wild you know what i'm saying and i and i rehearse and i'm like man why the hell would i write something like that because i know what i stand for Mm -hmm. and my my uh, neighbor always tells me she's a very biblical oriented lady she always tells me you can't taint your witness because once you take your witness which is yourself Mm -hmm. once you taint your witness it's hard to get that uh witness back Mm -hmm. so um as far as me when it comes to this music I just really try to uh, really understand why am I putting it out there? Like, mm-hmm. what's the essence of why I'm doing something? I have to have discretion bef- for everything that I do, man. Purpose. And where, where did that come from? Was that something that was instilled in you growing up? Is that, I'm just curious, like, did that come from nah, any particular man. place? Nah. The Bible says, uh, discretion shall preserve you, understanding shall keep you. You know, and what that means is if you have purpose and understanding, you're going somewhere. You mm-hmm. can have all the understanding in the world and not know what to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, the Bible says knowledge puffs one up. But you can have purpose also and a lack of understanding to what to do with that purpose. And that's the majority of this world right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have so much purpose, but don't understand the essence of what they're supposed to do with that purpose, man. Mm-hmm. You know, do you, do, so do, do you see that a lot in people that you might work with where you're yeah. just like, man, everybody seems to be going down that path. But you're just you're there and you're just you, you, you're kind of seeing these things happen. But you're saying to yourself. You know, I, I'm here because I need to be here because, you know, maybe studio time or whatever the case may be. But it's like, let me get in, do what I need to do and get out. Like, yeah. are there moments like that? Yeah. I mean, when I get to the studio, my uh, engineer, Louis G, shout out. That's a good brother right there, man. Mm-hmm. My engineer, Louis G, um, when I go to the studio, he knows, like, I'm there to work sometimes, man. And we laugh, we kick it. You know, that's my bro. But. If I'm there for a purpose, I'm not leaving till I get it done. Mm-hmm. Like I'm so I'm so serious with this man because that's how any business runs. You know, I'm sure if you were in a job interview, you're not gonna go there buddy buddy with your with your manager. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Not to put him on that level or not to put myself on a pedestal. It's just when you know you went somewhere to get something done, you gotta get it done. Right. You gotta move with a purpose. Yeah. Um, why Dallas though? Because Dallas. or, or mm-hmm. why still Dallas, right? Because yeah. Yeah, you, you know, you obviously born, you know, you've been here since 11, you said, mm-hmm. right? But I would imagine as an artist, from what I see, most people try to veer off into yeah. your L.A.'s or maybe to some degree New York or, you know, so you usually you make the connection with some of these other uh, big cities. Why Dallas, though? Well, I've been told a couple of times I need to leave Dallas. Mm. And a lot of people have told me you've got to leave to uh, really get on that level of success. And I beg to differ, man. I don't believe that at all. I can go and tour to areas, but I'm not leaving Dallas mm-hmm. and moving somewhere to blow up. That's that's cheating the game. Mm-hmm. Because then if I go there and blow the, blow up there, they're going to say they made me. Mm-hmm. Atlanta's mm-hmm. going to say I'm one of them. Mm-hmm. Because I technically I would. Because mm-hmm. I moved to that area to get a sense of uh, ahead of the game. Or I moved to L.A. to get a sense of ahead of the game. Why not get it out the mud? 
Mm-hmm. I love how Yellow Bees, he says in every, la- every last one of his interviews, anybody who comes up in Dallas got out the mud, man. They worked hard for it. Mm-hmm. Shout mm-hmm. out to Trap Boy Freddy. I saw him the other day at, uh, at uh, my gas station right down the street from my house. Um, you wouldn't even think that these people, when you see them, you wouldn't even think, man, this dude got it made. Just wearing a T-shirt. Homeboy mm-hmm. just wearing a T-shirt, walked up, shook my hand. You know what I'm saying? We dapped mm-hmm. it up, talked for a minute, and just I went to my car. Mm-hmm. And like Yellow Beezy said, anybody who came out of Dallas got it out the mud. They worked mm-hmm. every single day for what mm-hmm. they believed in. Mm-hmm. And that's me, man. Always working. That's character right there, man. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny you say that about, you know, you met him and, and you know, you seemed like a humble person. But, mm-hmm. you you know, you shook his hand. I'm sure you probably told him, hey, man, I love the work. Yeah. You know, and, and went about your business. Mm-hmm. You know, um, are you ready, right, for that potential fame down the line to where do you ever see yourself where it's like, man, I'm kind of sick of, you know, maybe people coming up to you or like, do you do you do you make sure that you kind of stay grounded or, you know, have you thought about that? Like, man, I might get to a point where it's like, you know, I, you know, can I still be the person that I am? Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like if you start off. Your, your mind. Your mind may change, your scenarios may change, but if you always believe in morals and a foundation, a foundation is what keeps you. You know, mm-hmm. if you believe in your foundation, you can always stay the same way. Now mm-hmm. you're going to be at, at different elevations, different uh, places in your life, but your mindset has mm-hmm. to be the same foundation of morals. That's mm-hmm. what's going to keep you grounded. Mm-hmm. So with me, when it comes to uh, people coming up to me, I've already had a couple people reach out to me on Instagram and say, uh, "Man, you're you're next up. You're Kendrick mm-hmm. Lamar of Dallas." Um, you know what I'm saying? You really touched my life. Some chick even hit me up and told me that her nine-year-old daughter listens to my song Insecure and only my song Insecure. That's dope. It is. That's dope. And I had to take that with a grain of salt and be really humble when she said that because I was like, okay, thank you. Thank you so much that your daughter is really into my, my music. But I don't want to sit here and act like, I'm, oh, I'm the best out of doubt because mm-hmm. it, it can get to that. It really mm-hmm. can get to that level. But I have mm-hmm. to humble myself, man, mm-hmm. because I know humility is, is speaks louder than anything. I so, agree. Yeah. I agree. What are, what are some of the struggles that you've had so far, man? Just just trying to get off the ground or just even at the state that you're at right now. Like, what are some of the challenges you dealt with even to get to this moment? I don't like lying, man. So I'm going to keep it so honest. Uh, I go broke. I go so broke for what I do, man. Like, I'm talking like 16 cent in my account. You know, mm-hmm. I get paid no more than a couple hundred dollars for my job. And I, I work with the children, of course. Mm-hmm. But I get paid a couple hundred dollars and I put all of that in my music, whether it be music videos, my uh, recording time or anything that caters to my career. Mm-hmm. So I go really broke for what I believe in, dude. Mm-hmm. And it's a struggle. It's mm-hmm. a struggle, man. I don't be out here wearing the, the latest and updated clothing or fashion. I really wish I could, but I believe in my my end goal more than I believe in today, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Dude, I, I I commend you for that. Thank you. I commend you for that. Um, Not many people understand that that that's the sacrifice that you got to, you got to make in yeah. order to get to where you're going. And so, um, you know, for you to even have an album that you said is coming out soon, um, obviously that shows that you sacrificed enough to get there. And I'm sure as you keep going and keep going and keep going, um, and that, that 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 should probably that's an interesting thing I want to ask you too. So then, what what is it that keeps you going, right? Because usually somebody will go through that exact same thing, mm-hmm. and they say, you know what, man, the same for me. Or you know, they 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 tap out. They say, man, forget this. It's not it's not reaping what I thought it was going to be immediately. And they go a different direction. What is it that's keeping you to say, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing through. I'm gonna keep grinding. Well, I mean, I always watch these videos like before they were famous type videos with the uh, you know. Um Anybody. And I heard Eminem's story about a month ago. And that dude has to be one of the worst people that I've ever heard, you know, like go through it. Like, and this is my, this is before there was social media. You know, Em was grinding out for like five years, man. And uh, he was getting nowhere. Dude wanted to kill himself because no one was paying attention to his music. That's how serious it got. And for me, I'm not at that level. And God forbid, I don't want, ever want to be at the level to where I'm like, man, skip it. I just want to end my life. For me, it's just, I believe I'm going to get there. My faith alone stands stronger than anything, man. I believe that I'm going to totally get there. And regardless of what level of status I reach, my music is already touching nine-year-old little girls. Mm. So if I I have to make $7 for my music, you know what I'm saying, and still work two jobs for two more years, I'm going to do that. 
until I get to where I'm going. Because mm-hmm. believe you me, if Brandon T. Jackson can pay attention to my music, mm-hmm. best believe somebody else is paying attention to my music. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You know, and it's a funny thing, man. You only need, you don't, how do I say this? There's this quote that I heard um, a little while ago mm-hmm. where it said that every great story that was ever written was written for one person. Mm. And and so it makes you think that I'm sure when you're creating things, you know, especially for me, when I'm, you know, I'm doing things like the podcast or any other content created, I'm sure you as an artist, I'm sure you go in there and you just say you're thinking about, well, how can I connect with one person? Mm-hmm. And hopefully maybe that that one person is a thousand people, it's a million people. But it's like, how can I how can I relate to one person? How can I get my message? How can I get what I what I'm saying to resonate with one person? And if if at the end of the day, one person can connect with it, that's more than it was yesterday. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's more than what a lot of other people can say who don't even take that step. And those, and when you have that mindset, it just adds up. Right. And so um, for you, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like, hey, I'm going to put it out there. You know, it's quality work. It's something I'm passionate about. You don't need to think about it. Like I need to convince a million plus people to, to, to like it. It's like if I can get one person to like it, that person going to tell two people. And if that person likes it, he tells three. So you see the, how the numbers game go and all you got to do, all you can control at the end of the day is what kind of content am I putting out? Mm-hmm. So Thanks. you can't control, you know, if random people have access to it per se, mm-hmm. but you can control the stuff that you put out there. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely commend you for, for staying positive on that. And it, it goes back to, if you're just doing it for that attention, what happens when it doesn't come? Right. Usually people are like, man, I'm good. You know what I mean? It's, it ain't it ain't working. And even with me, man, I don't... I would like to say, because every artist, J. Cole said on his last album or his couple recent albums ago, uh, Force of Drive, I think it's... I forgot the song, but he said every artist wants to be appreciated. That's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every person wants to be appreciated for the work. Mm-hmm. You know, we do... As, as the human race, we do things vainly, you know, just to get some attention. And I wouldn't say that's a bad thing because everybody has a talent and everybody wants to be appreciated for their talent. As artists, we go as far as, you know, sacrificing what's important to us now for what's, what may be important to us later. And I know the feeling of that, dude. Like mm-hmm. like I told you, I go broke for, for what I believe in. Mm-hmm. You know, and until somebody cuts me a check and sees the talent that I see, because I got to see it in me first before they see it. That's right. That's when the struggling ends. And I'm going to have a big story to tell, mm-hmm, man. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, you already know how it's going to play out, man. Because yeah. usually by the time people catch up to it, it's like, man, you've put in the work. And and it's funny how people, a lot of times people think people have overnight success. Never. When it's like, no. Never. You know, you've been grinding for X amount of people, but it's just that one video went viral. Mm-hmm. Or that, that one person co-signed you or that person. And then that's, you know, that's where people see you and they think, oh, because of that one, he shook that one person's hand, now he got him. And it's like, man, what, what did it take for me to even stand in front of that person, be able right. to be next to that person? A lot of hours went into what, a, you know, the things that you're doing. A lot of tears, too. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine. Um, I know you mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, you have something going on with Cosign. Mm-hmm. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, until they get back to me, of course, I was okay. I was actually uh, given the opportunity to almost do a cipher for them. Well, not almost, okay. but do a cipher for them. Okay. So if they get back to me, you know, I'm going to be on the cosine volume three cipher. If not, mm-hmm. that's okay. Even them reaching out to me lets me that I have talent. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And like I said, I see the talent in me first. That's just another person that sees the talent in me. Mm-hmm. That's a blessing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I agree. I agree. I want, I want to take a little bit of a shift, man, because I saw I saw a clip or I saw it was either in a interview you had or, or mm-hmm. just a clip where you were talking about like education. Yeah. And you, you, you kind of made a statement where it was like, hey, you know, you, you met a lot of people who have certain careers, very successful, didn't need to go to college for it. And, you know, you kind of digged a little bit deeper. Usually when people hear just just what I said, right? They a lot of people, I'm sure, you know, they 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 get a little bit defensive, right? right. Um, I'm I'm give you the opportunity. You can repeat what you said, but also just explain to us for the people who hand it for the first time. Yeah, because I think because I totally agree with you. By the way, so but thank you for everybody who hears uh, any interview that I do. I mean, I've always talked about the essence of college. College is a beautiful thing. It's a very great opportunity to network. You know, Gary Vee talks about the essence of networking and why it's important to surround yourself with familiar faces because it's not using them. It's if that person knows somebody, 
they get you to the next level. You know, you can you can help them get to the next level. That's called equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so with college, I believe it's a great area and avenue to network as far as a career path. You you mean to tell me I, I need to spend four to eight years trying to find out what I want to do? And by the time I'm done with those four to eight years, I owe you money? That makes no sense at all, man. That makes no sense. And then on top of that, let's get with the black community. Let's just tell the truth. I, I, I never get told about college until, you know, my sophomore year of, of uh, high school. And now my mom is telling me, hey, son, you need to go to college. You need to graduate. Not mine personally, but just in general. Son, you need to go to college. You're not going to make our family look bad. Well, the question is, did you go to college? And if you did, what are you doing with that career? I've had a lot of people at my previous jobs obtain degrees, business and finance. You know, these are typical degrees that the so-called black community obtains, business and finance. And they're working at the same area that I'm working at. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so why didn't you go pursue that career? Mm -hmm. And they never, they can never answer the question, man. It's a lack of motivation. Mm -hmm. Like I said in the beginning, so many people have purpose, dude, but don't know the knowledge of what to do with that purpose. Mm -hmm. You can have a degree all you want and still not know what to do with it and be I broke. Agree. I agree. Um, I, <laughs> man. So, you know, with, with college, you know, most people, I call it what it is, most people just go just to have fun. Right. That's it. You know, sleep around, do a little whatever. And, you know, you graduate, especially if you're an athlete, you're going to, you know, you're thinking about the next level anyway. You're not really thinking about utilizing this four years of education anyway. Right. Um, unless you need a, a specific, you know, you're going to a specific field where it's necessary, right? right. I.e. medicine and, you know, some of the, a lawyer or attorney. You, you need that, right? Because there's a level of standard there and in, in what you're walking into. But like you said, most people go in there for you know, subjects and, and, and degrees that they're not even going to use, but makes, just to finish. And it makes no sense, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and that even that credibility of I went to Stanford, mm -hmm. I went to Yale. I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, if you went to Yale, mm -hmm. you know, you're still working at a $40,000 $40, job a year. Mm -hmm. Not to discredit anybody who's in that level, mm -hmm. but you can't boast or brag on somebody with a degree that means nothing if you're still in the same area as a man who didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the essence of that? Mm -hmm. Like I said, the human race is vain. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I would even it's say America. It's just to say that they have it. Yep. Just to say, just they to say that they have it, that they feel some sort of you know, superiority or some sort of comparison to the next person. When, like you said, when you look at a lot of the um, you know, top percentile of billionaires out there, most of them didn't go. Right. Most of them, or if they went, they didn't finish. Right. I.E. Zuckerberg, I.E. Bill Gates. And, I mean, the list goes on and on. Steve Jobs. I don't even think he finished. I mean, it's just like they eventually found what it is that they wanted to do. And they realized that I don't need to go through this process in order to do it. And I'm going to keep it even honest. J. Cole said when he went to uh, Queens, New York, of mm -hmm. course, to go to college. I had some friends that went there with him. Yeah. He said mm -hmm. um, he wasn't necessarily there trying to get a degree. He went to New York so he can get in the hip hop scene. And I think that was one of the smartest things he did, because if you take away from that, that uh, sentence that he even just said, he was there to network. He was in New York to network. And what did he do? Ran right into Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So networking is so huge. And mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm so glad I have the platform to even say this. People here in Dallas have this jealous mentality. You know, if you network with this person, they get mad because he's not supposed to be with him. That doesn't make any sense. People in Dallas hold this this uh, crab in a bucket mentality. Like I want to be the one to put on Dallas. How come we all can't put on Dallas? Last time I checked, I didn't see not one face on California hip hop. You know, I know Nipsey Hussle out of, out of California. Mm -hmm. I know Kendrick, mm -hmm. J Rock. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Drake. So it's like we have got to get out of this mentality of I'm I've got to be the one. Mm -hmm. You know, because networking opens so many doors. Uh, the networking door is not is not only a certain few of people it's, it's broad to everyone if you allow it to be you know mm -hmm. so yeah so clearly you see the value in that <laughs> yeah um what are some things that you do to kind of make sure that you can maintain those relationships like are there certain things that you do do you you know obviously clearly how you carry yourself i'm sure is very important but are yeah. there other things that you do to just kind of make sure that you know this you know the people that you do meet that it can turn into some sort of a productive relationship down the line well, I mean, it's just about checking up on those people. Like, shout out to the Walker Review. You know, they interviewed me um, 
the brother Biwak Silo, he interviewed me about a couple months ago. That's a great guy, a genuine heart, you know, believes in God. And nevertheless, even that's not even on the subject. He's just a great person. He mm-hmm. boxes like I used to. Mm-hmm. Um, just a great person. So when I see him post something on Instagram or if I see him uh, doing something for his college, I may comment under it, you know, something funny, or I might just mm-hmm. check up with him. He's a very great guy. Um, a couple other interviewers like Lance from uh, Hand Over Art. You know, I promote his his merch still because that's the first person who gave me an interview. Mm-hmm. And I love being genuine to people who were genuine to me first. Mm-hmm. That was going to be my next thing. How are the people in Dallas? You know, how do they treat you in terms of, you know, when you're networking? But you I mean, you kind of answered. I don't know if you wanted to add to it, but yeah, I do. Go ahead. Yeah. I've, I've heard a couple of people say ignorant stuff like, uh, you know, don't talk. And this is off of a couple of people's stories that I've read. Some mm-hmm. guy said one time he said, um. Don't talk to uh, or don't try to get buddy buddy with people in Dallas just to get your foot in the door. That's corny. And I thought about that and I was like, you know how ignorant minded that sounds, man. That's so. You you literally are cutting yourself short when you say that. That's just like you saying, don't hand me that glass of water. I'll get it myself. Knowing you can't walk. <laughs> like, come on. So that's how uh, that's how Dallas is, man, when it comes to some of these artists out here. Me personally. Mm-hmm. I want to be the person that you know in the music and outside of the music. I just want to be Max. That's why I named myself Maximilian. You mm-hmm. know me. You know you know my name. You know me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about, I wanted to, going back to the music, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what what do you want people to take away from your music? You know, what, what impact you really want to have uh, on people when they're listening to your music? Hmm. Um, to you think. know, music music does things to people, yeah. right? You listen yeah. to R and B, it gets you in the mood. You know, you listen to rap. You know, what what do you want people to to feel from your music? To think, man. To really think. And like I like I do with J Cole, Kendrick, Logic, any person that I look up to in hip hop, I like to think. Any type of music should make you think. I believe there's a time and place for everything. Like I said, mumble rap is. I don't really agree with it, but mm-hmm. there's it has its place. You know. I'm not really on that new Mamba, whatever. What do you call it? Mo Bama? I don't even know. I don't even know what's called. Shiba <laughs> Shake. You asking I'm the wrong really, one, not, too. I know, don't even know. My engineer told my, my me My nephew might know. I might ask yeah, him. Yeah. What do they call it? I think it was Mo Bama, something like that, by Shaq West. But, you okay. know, my engineer told me. And that's supposed me, to be a style of music? Yeah. You know, oh, he told me there's oh, a time okay. and place for that. Stuff like that. There's a time and place. But when it comes to music, man, when it comes to my message, uh, insecure was nothing but subliminal messages. Mm. Nothing but subliminal messages. Nappy here, the Israelite, you may think I'm finna talk about the Most High God in that song. Man, I ain't say nothing about the Most High God until the third verse. Everything in the first and second verse is dealing with me as a person. Mm-hmm. You know, I love myself, my wealth is through my heritage. They ain't got nothing to do with, you know, biblical terms. I mm-hmm. could, anybody could say that. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to music, I really want it to be a subliminal message to people for people to really pay attention in and think on it. Kendrick yeah. Lamar, Kendrick Lamar's music does that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A lot of his music does that. Um, I would really Insecure. like to Insecure. What, what was the origin of that? Yeah. Cause that's a unique, you know, the name says a lot, but speak to us. Yeah, why, why that? Um, we weren't going to name it nothing else. When we first did Insecure and me and Maria B partnered up, um, we didn't think it would go as big as it would. You know, we were just talking about the insecurities that we deal with and things that we, you know, stress over. And she was talking about some things that she was dealing with. And we just put it into a song and we called it Insecure. And we didn't think, we did not think that it would, it would touch a level like this, man. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Shout is out to the, is that your biggest song to date? Is that yeah, the it one is. that? I would say it is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Man, it must have felt good. I saw you yeah. posted um, something recently. Um, I think it was a snapshot from Spotify. It yeah. was right where yeah. it shows like the amount. The I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, man, it was. Uh, I was like, what was it? A thousand people, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, it was. I think like eight K streams and like one K fans, man. But um, that was dope. It was dope to even receive something like that on that level. Like when I got the email from Spotify, I looked at it and I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I didn't know it would touch that level. So, yeah. And this is, because I don't know if you mentioned before. So, and how long would you say you've been seriously attacking music? Mm. Seriously. Like, like, you know, when you're like, man, I'm going to really pursue this. How long would you say that's been? Half a year. 
almost half oh, a year, man. Psh, like okay. uh, since it's May of last year. year. Okay. Yeah. Since May of last year, man. So yeah. Yeah, I see. I got it right from me. A thousand, you know, K fans. You know, forty four thousand minutes, man. Fifty three countries. That's what really got me. Yeah. When I first glanced at yeah. it, I'm like, man, because that's really what you want, right? You want as many outside ears. Yeah. It's possible, which goes back to what you said before about like, you know, why do you, why do I have to leave where I'm at? You know, you really don't these days you don't. And I kind of preach the same thing even with this, because again, people have these preconceived notions as, oh, you do it over here or do Mm -hmm. it over there. Mm -hmm. When in reality, then as long as you can reach people anyway, you can set up shop any way you, any way you want. It's like folding clothes in your house, you know what I'm saying? Or wearing your slippers to clean up, no matter if you wear them or not. You still got to get the house clean. No matter if you fold the clothes up in that area or in this area, it's still going to get folded up. Mm-hmm. So if you stay in Dallas long enough, like Yellow Beezy did, uh, shout out to him for even coming out of Dallas, somebody's going to notice you, man. And you got to, you really have to take pride of that when you say, man, I made it out of a small town, but even a small city full of jealousy and anger and so much bitterness where people were mad because we didn't want to work together. But now that can change. Mm-hmm. That can change. Mm-hmm. So... I look forward to the future, man. Nah, you got a bright future, bro. Thank you, you mentioned you mentioned boxing a few times, yeah. man. I yeah. love boxing, bro. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite sports. I didn't I I, I gained so much respect for it when I when mm-hmm. I was, used to do it back in New York, mm-hmm. and it was one of those things. I always say well, it's like that with all sports, but specifically boxing, right? Like people sit down and be like, "Why didn't he do this?" Or why didn't he throw the? I'm like. Yo, get your behind in the ring and for once Facts. or or just train with somebody and you'll realize the fatigue. The, Facts, I have man. so much respect for boxers. So much respect for boxers. I'm going to tell the truth. People sit up here and think they can fight for three minutes. You know how long three minutes is? <laughs> Most dude? people can't fight for three minutes. I would say the average You've person gasses fight? out in 30 seconds. Yes. For real. Yes. Because when when the average person begins to start fighting, man, they just throw Adrenaline. all the yeah, yeah. rush at you. Haymakers. They don't. Man, they don't take a second and breathe and mm-hmm. actually just work angles. Mm-hmm. You know, wherever you're at, there's still angles, mm-hmm. wherever you're fighting at. And a lot of people don't believe in just taking a second and analyze, okay, what can I do? Mm-hmm. For me, when I would get in the ring, it was always a chess game, mm-hmm. always a chess game. And I think my coach for allowing me to understand the essence of boxing because there's a total difference between you fighting and boxing. It's a mental game, bro. It is, man. It's a mental game. It really I, used to, is. I used to go to the boxing gym like right after work. And the reason why I enjoy doing it is is because I knew I had to be locked in, mm-hmm. right, with my trainer. Cause mm-hmm. he's shown, you know, there's 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 the techniques. So if your mind is somewhere else, chances are, you know, he's jab or whatever, he might hit you. Yeah. You might hit him, you know, throwing the wrong punch. Like you you have to be zoned in. And and so, you know, it's that's why I say it's, it's more like chess. You know, when you get in that ring, like you said, you you setting up shots, you know, you're avoiding hits, you working angles. Um, and I appreciate the mental game of it. Mm-hmm. You know, not just the, the, the physical, you know, there's, there's there's athletes out there. There's people who's just tremendous conditioning. And even then, I would still say if you've never boxed, like, I don't care what else you do, yeah. <laughs> but it, it won't always translate to this. But from a mental standpoint. So do you think. Do you feel like, you know, even those that skill set translates over to your music? Oh, of course. I was just about to touch on that. Mm-hmm. Um, boxing, when you get in the ring, you can either be scared or, you know what I'm saying, you can go in there with an anticipated plan and say, okay, forget the fear, man. I'm doing this. And I've, I've had my nose broken. You know what I'm saying? Or I wouldn't even say broken. I've had a, a bloody nose just like straight running. I've had a kidney shot. and I've been dropped. You know, I've been not knocked out, but I've been dropped. Everything that almost every boxer has went through is happening to me. And when it happened, I was like, oh, damn, I didn't think it would be like that. You know, Mm -hmm. so when it happens, I think fear is the biggest uh, assumption of anything. Mm -hmm. Fear just just makes everything bigger. Mm -hmm. But when I first got my nose, my bloody nose bleed, I didn't even feel it. Mm -hmm. My my homeboy's girlfriend came to me. She said, oh, your blood, your nose is bleeding. Mm -hmm. Same thing with music. Um, when I got on the stage and I was performing, my mic was too loud one time, but nobody noticed unless I would have noticed. Mm. So you really just have to control your your field wherever you are. That's why it's even called MC. You're a mic controller. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the crowd controller. Mm-hmm. If somebody, if you if you hit a note on accident that you wasn't trying to hit, don't make no face. You know, mm-hmm, keep it going, mm-hmm. bro. Keep it going. Keep you're a performer. Yeah. You gotta you gotta roll with it. Yeah. Do you have any favorite boxes? Man, a lot. 
A lot. Um, I wouldn't you know, say, Errol's from the from, oh, from of Dallas. Oh, of course, he's, of course. He's he went, us he went out to my. Uh, he used to go to my old gym, um, on the grind gym. Really? Yeah, he did. Um, I like Errol, man. He's big time. Earl was Earl's a humble dude, man. Mm-hmm. He's a real humble dude. People say he used to fight people out in DeSoto and just walk off. That's dope. Yeah, that's dope. <laughs> that's dope. But um, uh, a lot, man. I Earl like, be uh, whooping some people out here, boy. Shout out to it. Errol Spence. Believe it or not, dude, I like Julio Cesar Chavez. Um, okay. Anthony Joshua. I love heavyweight. You players. like Joshua? Joshua's cold. So wait, hold on, man. Josh, no, dude. Hold I've on, been so following you know, Anthony wait, Joshua since 2016. Yo, he is, I've known about let this. Let me tell day. you right now, man. Jo- Joshua ain't looking good in these streets right now, oh. bro. Because why he ain't fighting Wilder, bro? Okay. Why is he running uh, from that man? 50 mil? 50 mil, I'll take the fight. <laughs> 50 million? I don't know too many people turn out 50 million, bro. I don't know, man. I really can't. I really can't. He's playing mind games. He's I know Wilder just got done fighting. Uh, what's his name? Um, um, uh, Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. And when he fought him, Tyson Fury has good head movement. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Man, Dante took that dude out. He mm-hmm. he was putting hands on him. Mm-hmm. And so Anthony, I was safe with his part right here. I Anthony's still think Anthony boxer. Joshua can beat Dante Wilder. I still think he can. I, I I could see it. I'm not one of those people who's like, nah, he's on lose. I, I could see it. Did you see how he did to come? Even if he didn't watch the fight, Anthony Joshua mm-hmm. tore to come up. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And to come mm-hmm. is a very he's like he's almost like Dante Wilder. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the reason I think Anthony Joshua was ducking it just probably get more just experience. Uh, I figured more yeah, experience. He's his manager. Yeah, more you know, experience. They're trying to build it up. Yeah, you know, take a page out of the whole Floyd Mayweather Pacquiao thing. Mm-hmm. That thing dragged on for damn near three to five yeah. years before it actually happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a horrible fight. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. We got set up. We got fight. set up for nothing. Yeah. So I'm hoping this, yeah. but I know this one because you know the heavyweights, man. They ain't, ain't gonna be a lot of moving in that ring. <laughs> so, quick question: How do you feel about the Conor McGregor versus Mayweather fight? So many people thought that Conor was gonna win. So many people thought. I don't know why people thought that. People yeah. who don't watch boxing thought yes. that because I don't care what this man does. You don't learn boxing in three weeks, right. four weeks, right. a month, two months. And and beat a world class fight who's been doing it his entire life. And oh, and by the way, he's one of the best in the business, dude. Even if you That's learn crazy. how to do the uh, you know the tactics to it, you you're, that conditioning, dude. Mm-hmm. Mayweather runs an annual six miles daily, man. Like his boots nothing. in his boots. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. He just get up like the way we get up to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. He just gets up and like I'm just gonna go run six miles. And people hear that number, <laughs> they think it's crazy, but it's like. When I was boxing, I would run, I would clock out three to four miles and it would feel so good. Mm-hmm. You know, my, shout out to my homeboy Brandon. You know, he's still boxing mm-hmm. up mm-hmm. in Washington. Uh, when we would run together, we would get so lost of time because we're just running, having a good conversation and just working. You don't even feel the pain. Mm-hmm. So that's, imagine how Floyd Mayweather weather feels for six miles, man. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So boxing. Yeah, yeah I've, seen, I've seen him do some road work, man. Yeah. Man, and just leaving guys and. and yeah. Yeah, his conditioning is is all time high, mm-hmm. and to get to that level, you know, you that's that's an athlete, mm-hmm. that's God gifted, you know, because most people are not conditioned that way in any capacity in mm-hmm. any sport. You see what I'm saying? Whether you playing basketball, football, whatever it is, most people um, conditioning is not that high. Yeah. Um. So boxing from a cardio standpoint, that's like numero uno, you know. So. And it's cool, too, because, you know, they say we're running. It's it's mental, too. You know, it's yeah, like a peaceful really thing. Is. You know, you get to think. You get to the body at some point goes into automatic. You know, legs are just moving. But it's like your mind now starts to starts to pick up. And yeah. so when I was writing 914 before I was uh, kicked out the, the house, of course, which is the whole theme of the project, I would run a lot, man. And I would just drown out my, you know, my issues through music and just run before I even picked up music, you mm-hmm. know, half a year ago. And I will go hit the heavy bag. I'm an extroverted person. So mm-hmm. working out for me is like a beautiful thing, man. Mm-hmm. That's how I relieve a lot of my stress. That, writing music, or just, you know, spending time with God, man. A lot of people don't do that either. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people think it's corny to set some time apart to read your Bible. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't do that nowadays. So, yeah, yeah. you got to... You- you got to know why you're doing things. You yeah. Know what I mean, you, you, you have to be in tune with that. Um, and again, it's funny, you know, you bring it up the Bible is just, mm-hmm. I always tell people it's, it's a historical book, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's just like everything else. So right. whether you can say you don't know who wrote it or, or what version, it's a historical book. Anytime you have something that has been around for deck beyond before you was even here. 
Right. You can't just invalidate that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And, and so even, even the morals, man, you got to think about the morals. And the all right. Yeah. The content. Yeah. That's again. The, then you dive into the content. Right. But you first have to understand it's a historical book and it's something that's to be studied, mm-hmm. not to be read. This isn't, you know, just a novel you just read one time and you're like, oh, you yeah, got it. Right. It's something that's supposed to teach you. You're supposed to be able to pull things from. And so you may have to go back to it a few times to get a level of understanding. The crazy thing about that even is anybody who knows me from Kenimer Middle School on to ninth grade of, you know, Dunkerville High School, they know I was a totally different person. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Even my girl right here, I wasn't the same person I am now. You know, mm-hmm. like how were you was, before? Were you I wouldn't even like streets, to say, grinding. I wouldn't even like to say streets, man. You know what? what I would it? say trying to get in the streets. Because mm-hmm. when you're young and you have no father in the house mm-hmm. and your mom is doing nothing but yelling and beating your ass, you mm-hmm. want to find somewhere to fit in at. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to find that click of dudes and you want to feel hard. You want to feel like, yeah, I'm that dude. You know, don't fuck with me. You, mm-hmm. you, you want to mm-hmm. feel like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was trying to get into a couple of sets, but God willing, it just never worked out. Gangs, you, you're referring to mm-hmm. when a you say sets. Gangs. Yeah, people listening who don't know what sets mean. <laughs> yeah, I was, <laughs> right. to, I, want, I was trying to, you know, I, I never really wanted to affiliate myself, but I was always throwing up the blood sign, you know, Pyru blood. And mm-hmm. I never even really knew what it, what it meant. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to seem like I was doing something. Mm-hmm. And I think the black community, we really, or even as minorities, we really affiliate manhood. Mm-hmm. With gang, mm-hmm. and that's the worst thing we could ever do. Mm-hmm. Because if manhood means throwing up colors and killing your own kind for colors, mm-hmm. you've got the worst I, definition for what manhood means. I man. agree. So yeah. I agree. And man, I, I tell you, like like you said, I could say the same thing for myself. Yeah. You know, growing up, um, you know, being in Brooklyn, surrounded by gangs, you know, Crips, Bloods. You know, I went to a high school that was, it was predominantly Crips, but there was Bloods there as well, and it was probably it was. I, I believe at the time it was ranked probably the most dangerous school to be in in that in that district. Mm-hmm. Like dudes were getting stabbed. Like and, and by the way, they had metal detectors. So it made you wonder, like, clearly people are finding ways to get stuff in here. You know, it was just, it was that bad. Um, so I know what it is when you you see those things around you and you almost adapt to your environment. You know, I found myself, you know, if I had a homeboy that I was cool with and he was blood or he was crib. You guilty by association. You see what I'm saying? Even if you don't even you you didn't go through the process yourself, but it's like you you kind of pick up those habits. Mm-hmm. But then you know you something along the way. You know you 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 kind of realize that you know what this ain't for me. You know uh, this this ain't the life that I really want. And mm-hmm. then you just it's like you're in it, but you're not in it. And then you get older and you just really start to detach yourself. And then you see those other people who never really got grew up and got out of it, those same people, you know, they're dead now. Those in same prison. people in jail now. Because it's cool when you're young, when you're 15, 16, nobody's really paying attention to you, you're doing little petty things. But then when you start getting, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and you you shooting people, you see what I'm saying? And you, you running in people's houses, you know, stakes is much higher. You know, so a lot of those people, you know, that I know, and either dead, either... There's people who... I know dude that was getting beat up as a full grown adult because of people who still had that mentality of what they remember when they was in high school. And that's ignorant because <laughs> it's like, are you serious? Like I like to say, you know, I, I don't like to speak on things I've never experienced, but even as a community, as a black community, we shouldn't be like, come on, man, I agree. you, you, you want to kill another Life person. Life is more valuable colors. than that. Life is definitely more valuable than that, man. Like over colors though, mm-hmm. for real, mm-hmm. no matter what the foundation is. In fact, mm-hmm. before you even knew, before there was a blood or a crip, it was first the Black Panthers. So who are you dishonoring? Are you dishonoring the crip or are you dishonoring the Black Panther? You know what I'm saying? You have to also understand who put the guns in the community and the colors and told you kill them because they're wearing different colors. Mm-hmm. When you have, when you both have the same black skin, mm-hmm. who told you to do that? Mm-hmm. You know, you really, I think people should watch this video called uh, COINTELPRO. And an FBI agent breaks down the essence of how they started destroying black they would call it black messiahs or um, really intelligent black people. They took down Huey P. Newton. You know, they took down, uh, they re- really well constructed on how they took down Dr. King. Mm-hmm. Um, even how they assassinated Malcolm X. You mean to tell me there was one police officer there? One police officer there the day he was there? And I really look up to Malcolm X. I really like Malcolm. Because he knew. He, you know, Mal- he did. Even him, even Malcolm, uh, not Malcolm, Martin, he knew. Yeah. You know, uh, the day of, they, they know. And, and that's what's, 
that's what's so crazy about it because it's just like I tell people all the time, you know, it's one thing to believe in something. It's another thing when you know your life is on the line. Most people, once once that's the stakes, once that's on the line, they just, I, you know, I kind of do believe in it, but not that much, you know. And then there are people who's just like, I know what I'm saying and I know what I'm doing is going to be unpopular. And I know I'm going to have people in my circle that's going to turn it back. And I'm going to and I'm probably not going to live to be 80, 90. But I believe in this so much. You see what I'm saying? I believe in this so much. And I know that my words is going to last long. I know that, you know, I'm making a difference in somebody's life and they do it. Yeah. So they don't. So I tell people all the time, don't think for a second like they was just walking out their house or they went in there and they thought nothing was going to happen. They knew. Yeah. And they still did it. You see what I'm saying? It's like you feel the fear and you still do it. That says something, man. That's character. That's that's yeah. when you really believe in something. The big fact that I really took from respect is even even when I call them devils, you know, the FBI said Malcolm was so, so of an upright man. They had nothing on him because he was just that upright. And that's how I want to be. I don't want another person to watch my lifestyle mm-hmm. and say, uh, man, that dude, is, that dude is doing that or he's doing that. I want to be the first person to point myself out and say, nah, that ain't right, man. It's mm-hmm. not right. So even though I do have my flaws and still have mistakes, I believe as people we have to get to the point where we say, nah, I don't want, I don't want to do that no more because mm-hmm. it's going to affect me. And I believe in generational curses. It's going to affect my children. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't think like that. They don't think about their son in the future. We all claim we want kids. Mm-hmm. So think about them. You know, how it's going to fuck their life up when mm-hmm. they start getting into it. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah. You, you, you touched on it a little bit. And, I, and I, I'm not asking you to get too deep with it if you don't want to. But mm-hmm. you, you did hint to it a little bit when you mentioned about you know, not having like that father figure, you know, mm-hmm. growing up, you mentioned, you know, just you, you and your mom and how she, you know, you, you kind of running around, but you, you, you credit that, like there wasn't that masculine energy there. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you just, which is usually the case. I mean, that's, that's typically what happens, right? It's like, now you're finding, you're looking for it in other places, right? Were you, even the way, you, you know, you are today, where you, do you have mentors? Do you have people that you eventually was able to to you know to get some knowledge, some information from the male figures. Were you able to? Was there anybody that you can accredit and say, man, you know, that person really taught me some game. You know, they really taught me about being a man, or they really gave me some information that I needed at a critical time in my life. Of course, man, I have a lot of people who have always influenced me. And as corny as it may sound, I'm not even gonna call it corny. There's an anime called Naruto, man. And in Naruto, this guy looks up to almost everybody who has influenced or shaped his lifestyle. And that is the Hokage that he is today. You look at his his uh, his Hokage period and you can see a speckle of everybody that's influenced his life. Mm. You know, and if you don't watch Naruto, I pity you. But that's a great representation of mentors Mm. because that kid grew up with no mother, no father and became the Hokage of a village that hated him. Mm -hmm. You know, a demon, Mm -hmm. an evil. They call him an evil person. Mm-hmm. And so as a as another black kid in the black community, because we already have one thing against us, you know, just being young black boys. Mm-hmm. Um, when you grow up with no father and you start looking at other people as your father, that's it's very bad. Mm-hmm. But when that person grows in your life and teaches you an essence of something mm-hmm. and teaches you who you are, that's the greatest thing about a mentor. Mm-hmm. And I can say I've, I've had a couple of great mentors in my life, even good friends who've taught me, mm-hmm. you know, lifelong lessons. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, now, that's powerful, man. Um I have a segment that, that I'm that I'm adding to to my podcast where I ask I ask my guests a couple questions. Not not questions. I'm sorry. I mention a word mm-hmm. and you can you can reply back to me with what comes to what comes first to your mind, either a phrase or a person. Mm-hmm. OK, so it's just, you know, four 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 words that I have here. Success. Hard work. Life. Unity. Family. Hmm. That's a hard one. <laughs> That's a real hard one. Uh, typically is. For family, man. Trust. Dallas. Hmm. Unknown. Okay. Okay. So, man, we, we, we're going to wrap up. Was there anything that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to cover, bro. Uh, I have a new song dropping on the 21st. Uh, it is called Mama, You Did It, and it is another addition to 914 Duncanville. So, yeah, just look forward to uh, more content, you know, more uh, 
just more singles coming out, man, until I get this project out because I'm still working on it. Some days I get in the studio and record. Some days I write more to it, but I'm still working on the project. But mm-hmm. until then, Mama, you did it December 21st. Mm-hmm. Tell people where to find you. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at official Maximilian. You can also go on to www.princeofaking.com for more content. And uh, for more info, just email me at officialmaximilian at yahoo.com. Man, I appreciate you coming on, my brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. Guys, if you out there, um, definitely leave a comment. Leave a, you know, leave a like on this video. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening to it uh, on your podcast app, iTunes, please leave a review on iTunes. It does help the show. He's considered signing up to the Patreon. So that way you can see this episode prior to the release. Make sure you follow my man, Max, right here. He's doing some great things, man. Much success to you in regards to the music, man. Thank you. Thank you guys out there for watching, listening. We out. Peace.